Stephanie, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Happy Star Trek first I know, Star right? day. Your hair looks lovely, by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's coming back. It's so funny because I'm so, for so many, like for a couple of years, I was so used to having no hair at all. And so it's, you know, it's a, it's a process. I, part of me is like, someone pay me to shave it again. I'm totally done with that. I read that you are a long hauler cancer survivor. I am. And my power to you, I have uh, the, uh, the BRCA gene and I've survived skin cancer and my wife died of cancer. My father, my father-in-law oh, cancer. I I'm hate so cancer. sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you're fighting cancer. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We're everybody. doing, I'm like, knock well, knock wood. We're not, you know, we're not quite to Star Trek levels of, you know, abilities to catch, but you know, you, if you catch it early preventative, you know, if you catch it early, you know, outcomes in like overall intensive treatment is less so like it's it, my mom died of a rare cancer. And when I had my first round of chemo, it was nine years afterwards. And the guy next to me had the same kind of literally incurable cancer. And the nurse was like, yeah, if you catch it early now, it's like a chronic condition. And I'm like, holy shit. Like science is amazing. I mean, it science is, is, amazing. It is. It really is it's but. seven years since my, um, um late wife died and she knew she had issues in 2014 and waited too long and by the time they finally detected it was stage four so it was like oh I'm so oh god thank you I, so, I, I'm the person that goes with if I have a hangnail I go to the doctor so yeah. yeah it's well it's a hard thing it's you know I feel like a also for you being the I mean having to be the person is such a hard other thing that people don't talk about enough because you're like yeah well because you're like well I can't complain because I don't have cancer and I'm like no you still have feelings like it's just it's it's, true and also when you lose your mom I mean my dad uh he had like 30 I think it was was it was it 17 days from diagnosis to death and oh god killed me but I will tell you as a transgender woman my best friend and I both woke up to the possibility that maybe we should explore this gender identity question because of the loss of our father. It's sort of like this moment where you say, you know, wow, life is short. I only have so much time on earth. I really should explore this. So yeah. I, 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 in a way, I'm grateful to my dad for giving me that gift of taking a moment and pausing and saying, you know, I really should look into this. And uh, 10 years later, next month, it'll be 10 years. Oh my God, happy <laughs> almost 10 year anniversary. Yes, very happy. 10th birthday, 10th birthday. It'd be 10th <laughs> birthday, right? Now, I, I read that you're also a member of our LGBTQ community. How do you identify? What are your pronouns? Uh, oh, my pronouns she, are, are she, they. I, I, it's, yeah, it's not even, not even new. It's, I went to college during the height of the AIDS crisis, right? And I had friends who were definitely lesbian, like, and I was concerned, I considered myself more bisexual, but also that's in its own right with friends who are like, oh, that's like a really easy way to kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, so, you know, uh, what's the word to pass a little bit? Yeah. You know, I didn't yeah. like, I really didn't contend with gender in particular. Like I knew that I had, I knew that my gender expression didn't really have a term mm-hmm. growing up because word, I was always, right? it wasn't a word. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. Cause I have so many friends like this gay men, get men friends who are like, my friend's daughter is identifying as, and I'm like, you need to calm down because when I was coming of age, like all of my friends were, you know, it was usually like, there's, there's uh, what am I thinking? There's um, tomboys <laughs> and, you know, and if you were, girl, and then maybe you were a lesbian or, but on the flip side of that, if you showed anything that was a feminine trait, specifically as biologically a man, you were, you were just made fun of. And yeah. I just feel like this generation of kids have finally a term for something that I'm like, oh, I understand this. And in particular for me, you know, I've been attracted romantically and sexually to all genders for a long time. It took me a while to be, I think, open about it simply because I was like, oh, if I'm attracted to men too, then it, this is just easier. And I'm already trying to be an actor. Um, <laughs> but when I, you know, but I've had open conversations with partners about that for years. 
Um, yeah. And in terms of identity, gender identity, I think it really, for me, when I shaved my head, I looked in the mirror and went, oh, there you are. Because for the first time, I did not feel constrained by the idea of what feminine was or woman was. Like, I knew unequivocally, like, if anyone has ever referred to me as a man, I'm like, fuck no. But I always felt like there was this other thing that we couldn't point to. And when I was bald, I felt like when I lost my hair, when I was bald, that I fully fell into myself because... I wasn't having to identify as one thing or another. I was just me, you know? Hair is such a, uh, a gendered thing. Oh my God. Oh my God. So much. And I can't, it, I can't get over the, how many people uh, will say to me, oh, you're wearing a wig. Or they try to troll me by saying, it's a guy in a wig. And I'm like, you know how many women wear wigs or hair extensions or color their hair? Yeah. I, is, I always say when people ask me, is that your real hair? I said, yes, it's mine. I paid for it. Yeah, well, I just, you know, and I and it's so. Inter- I also think it's so interesting. I'm like it's so interesting to me because, you know, as I get older, I find, especially went to acting. You know, I went to acting school, so I was in the LGBTQ community all the time and considered myself part of it, but not an like an ally, but part of it. And also, I also felt because I am totally one of those people that I'm like, well, if I haven't been oppressed in a specific way, am I allowed? Oh, yeah. To, be, to claim to be part of a community who I love so deeply. Because I recognize, like, again, as I said in college, like my friends who were out and proud were walking the streets as the Pink Panthers, getting their asses handed to me. And I was, you know, and I didn't have to go through that. So sometimes I'm like, am I allowed to do that? You know, I, you know, so I'm like, fuck it. I'm old. I, I have cancer. You're not old. What are you well, talking I'm not old. about? But I'm like, I mean, part of me is like, fuck it. I have cancer. And specific That's- now, as I have a plat or as I have a platform specifically, as you know, not, not to because being alive is fucking political. Specifically, when we're watching as they've like you know ripped apart Roe v. Wade, and now you have an entire you know a political party specifically trying to stir up anger at people who at. At friends of mine who've already been marginalized and have for and literally it's not because it's for the children it's not for the fucking children it's to it's to get votes there is nothing there is nothing about this all about the votes all about it's all about the votes and it it drives me fucking insane and and it's funny because i'm like i'm just like fuck you all just fuck you all like i mean in a way in a in, in almost a bigger way i think than even roe v wade because for some reason, I thought that anybody who had a uterus and wanted autonomy over their body would be like really angry. And there's people that aren't. And I'm like, I just don't understand. But there's also a lot of religious base. Some of it is ethical. But my bottom line is I have no control over your body. Yeah. And that's how it should be. And no one should control over my body. And as a trans woman, I also am favor of reproductive rights, not just for trans men, but because I don't want a man telling me what to do with my body either. Yeah, I mean, well, and it's, and it, and where they get, you know, where they get off on it, especially when it comes to reproductive rights is this idea of, and again, it's the same thing that they're doing when it comes to gender affirming care. Right. It's this idea that it's, they're trying to make something that is so nuanced, so black and white. And I just can't, I can't wrap my brain around because I mean, my brother, he, his, his wife has two daughters who had to have late term abortions because of the danger to their health like it was awful and i and i have other friends on the flip side who like birth control didn't work but it is such a large thing on that level yes also you have it is hard enough being a fucking human it is hard enough being an adolescent it is hard enough being a child so to suddenly to suddenly be being like trying to put yourself in between what parents are trying to do to raise healthy and happy humans is none of your fucking bi- none of anybody else's fucking business as far as far as I'm concerned you know as long as you are not hurting other pe- like directly hurting other people I don't fucking care you I know interviewed Buttigieg, uh, back in January and he said all this fight about parents rights well what about the rights of parents who want to raise their kids with affirming gender care or affirming um their uh sexual orientation 
don't yeah. those parents have rights too? Yeah, I, I got, got I love him for them, so but not rights for everyone. I I love him so much. When he oh my when god, he's amazing. When he announced, I was like, you will get my money because I don't think you're going to get the. I don't think you'll get the presidency this no, time. But, but I need to keep you in this conversation as long as possible. How cool is it we have somebody queer in the cabin? I mean, it's just great. Right? And well, then and I, Levine and everyone else. So yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like we every time we make a step forward, though, there's the Margaret Taylor Greens and Lauren Boebert's and the yeah. Ron <laughs> DeSantis. I have to Ron, Ron DeSatan? Yeah. Ron DeSatan? Ron DeSatan. You know what he's doing now? July 1st, my BFF in the whole world, Maya Monet who I hope you say hello to Maya for me. Um, I, will. I will. She is telling me that the new law says she won't be able to use the women's bathroom. She won't be able to use her doctor for gender affirming care. She's a trans woman. She needs hormones. Yeah. yeah. Starting July 1st as an adult. It's not just the kids. Oh yeah. No. Well, they're just, it's, it's, what's interesting to me about Florida. What's interesting to me about Florida and how he's playing, he is, he is playing so deeply into like the extreme right wing of Trump voters because he knows he's going to run and he knows he needs them. But the thing about it is if you look at fucking what happened, hell yeah, in Wisconsin last night, like we have a generation. Oh yeah. Oh gener- yeah. We have a generation of kids who is like, go, at, who do not declare themselves as, as Democrat or Republican because of what, but again, but they are not going to put up with that bullshit. And no. so it's, and it's, 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 it's like the, I mean, somebody said this when Trump got in, that was like the last deep breath of toxic masculinity, but oh my God, they just keep giving it air. And yeah. I don't, and everybody who's in the, in the path of that is, I just feel such empathy for, because I'm like, all you're trying to do is live as a human being. Like, it's just, it's like the idea that, the idea that this man in those ugly white boots, oh my God, but you know, it just, all of the shit that he is doing is just not going to fly. It's not going to fly nationally. I mean, you already had Disney, Disney go, like, I, I, I'm not a big corporate fan, but the shit that that Iger did to basically pull his, you know, DeSantis is right away to like legislate for them. I'm like, hell yeah. Like it just... I learned a new word today. Um, I, again, I manage the podcast studio here at the university. Yeah. And someone came in and talked about the manosphere. Oh, I God. love that word because it's basically, it explains this purified air that these people live in where they think that they are always right and that we don't have a voice. Yeah. We actually, you know, we have equal rights and equal voices, but we're not given those rights. We're not allowed to practice those yeah. rights. Those rights are being withheld. I'm so glad to hear you uh, talk about this activism. I think that there is actually an entire section of Star Trek that doesn't understand that what Roddenberry and all the other Star Trek creators have done is think about the diversity and about inclusion. And they're arguing against, you know, woke Trek or new Trek. And while I don't think Picard went there, it does show something that is very important to me as a trans woman, the family you choose, mm-hmm. not necessarily a birth family, but being yeah. able to have the family you choose. Now, it, it's really emotional in terms of how Jack got fucked over <laughs> yeah. by not having a father all his life. But can you talk to me a little bit about how you felt uh, as someone whose father loved Star Trek, which I read, and whose mom was a cosplay uh, seamstress? I would love to know what you thought of the whole idea of this idea this evolution of star trek in this new universe of different kinds of star trek i thought that one of the one of the big things again for me because my i have this connection to star trek through my parents in this very strange way like my dad loving it and my dad being very very kind of he was very Klingon. He loves the Klingons, but like he was very angry and didn't know how to express it. And then my mother was very spiritual. Like, and so there was something for me in playing a Vulcan, who we again gave a little bit of Delta to, which I appreciate, um, of being on this starship, granted, not in primary position for narrative, but being part of this. I don't want to, almost legacy 
of family in all these different ways. And I think the thing that's super special to me about the way that Terry Matala set up this season and the way that we specifically as bridge crew members were invited to be part of the narrative, but also in a larger scale in a way that the way that Terry put us out in the universe, even though he didn't have to, made us even more a part of that family. Mm -hmm. And it just, you know, it's that like no small part, there's no small parts, only small actors. Like I feel Mm -hmm. fully, and sometimes I'm like, Steph, you don't even say that much, but I'll be like, you've got to do it. Like, I'm so, I so promote this show because I feel like, and I call it my show, you know, even though I'm not Ashley or I'm not LaVar because I'm part of it. Yes. And, you know, that kind of connection, the fact that, you know, we're looking at different generations, we're also seeing, as you start to see Jack, as you start to see, you know, Sydney, we're also seeing track we're seeing this universe through different and younger eyes. You know, it means the world to me that Jin, who is non-binary in life, also is specifically non-binary in this show. Like, you know, it with, and it's, and it's, it's, I think in the way that Roddenberry envisioned, because we're not like, oh, by the way, like having to point it out, it's just, it's not, we're pointing it out. It just is. Right. It's just part of who we are. I like to say that being yeah. trans is the fifth most interesting thing about me. Yeah. Yeah. Except for people who've never encountered anything like that before. And, you know, and that's the beauty of Trek overall is we're looking to, I think, you know, we're looking to a place where, as opposed to, you know, fighting everything, I, there's a a theory that like Star Wars fights everything <laughs> and Star Trek welcomes it in, you know? Yeah, true. And it's this idea that, I mean, we're seeking out new worlds, not to conquer them, to, but to commune with them, you know? And, and, and everything we do in that is, you know, I, I feel like a little bit this season is a, not a comeuppance, but because we are going back to, D, you know, DS9 and things like that, we're like looking at where we've come because that has been Picard's journey throughout the three seasons, right? right? To look look at what we've created and what's happened. Like Todd's monologue about, you know, book five or nine, just and watching, you know, Patrick react is sure. so often older generations don't look at the mess they've made because they're not Todd aware of too. everything that governments do in their name you know you mentioned an interview with uh, greek girl authority that you and todd know each other previous to yeah the card so tell me about oh my god what it's like because we got to interview him in the junket before the show premiered and Mm -hmm. what a riot i mean he's great my god one of our new favorite new characters absolutely my god right he's he is one of he was it's so it's so funny. I he's from Chicago. I am I'm from Southern Wisconsin. I grew up like a suburb away from him. Years later, not not many years later, we're not that old. We're, there's not that big of a difference. And then he stayed in Chicago. I went to New York. He was in New York when I was in New York. Like our paths just never crossed. Even though like there was part of me that was aware of what he, when he was doing Burn Manhattan because he was a Second City guy, and he came out to L.A. And I was, when I came out, I did a um, showcase to, you know, get an agent, whatever. I think it was almost 20 years ago now. (laughs) And the guy who had arranged it hired Todd to direct it. And then I liked him and I took his acting class. And then he booked, he was only at the studio for a little while. And then he booked The Riches and he had an improv studio that he had opened. And that's, it was called The Hot House. Oh. And, I, and that's where I went. I went and took, that was my first experience, like larger experience in improv, which, and I adored it. I adored the way that he and his partner had set it up. And so we kept interchanging and we just knew each other. So he was kind of my teacher, but not, but we were in each other's lives because we knew these people. And then a good friend of ours also ended up having breast cancer. And I had known her through some things, but he, she was a very good friend of his for years. So it was one of those things that we're kind of circling and we knew each other, but 
but didn't necessarily hang out all the time. But it's that weird false intimacy you have when you're on social media and you, you and you're like, I know everything about you. And then suddenly you get to sit and sit down in real life. And literally, I think for the first day or two we were on set, it was just like, rah, rah, rah. like, because we, you know, we hadn't seen each other sure. in person for God, like, I want to say eight years. Like, it had been a long, long time. And the funny thing is, is that last time he was on Star Trek, he had the ears. And this right? time it's your turn. Right? <laughs> he is also one of those people. He is so, and he's always been, as long as I've known him as an instructor. And even and it was one of the reasons I loved him as an instructor. Because so often I felt that in drama schools, everyone's like, you do it this way. There was a right way. And that's been something that I'm like, there's not the right way. It's yeah. just, don't make it right. Just make it real. Because everybody is different. I love that. I, don't make it right. Make it real. Oh, that's great advice. That's become like, I have to, like, it's like, it's my mini mantra. Because sometimes I'll get very in my head about it. It has to be right. I'm like, don't make it right. Make it messy. Make it, make it real. Make it feel real. And you're, you know. And Todd was one of those people. He was the first person I ever encountered who was like, okay, we're doing comedy, but what's your take on this? Because your vessel is going to be different than anyone else's. And I was like, oh. And that's what's so beautiful about how Todd works. But also, he is one of the people that I've known, only people I've known in my life, who genuinely just, it feels like he's playing. And he brings a levity to a set that is so lovely and just makes the working environment that much better. I remember, I think it was one of the times he was not on and Jonathan Frakes had worked with him before and was, I think, asking Terry in holding, like, have you met? You guys, have you met? Do you know Todd yet? Like, have you met him yet? And they're like, no, he's like, you're going to love him. He's great. He's the so much fun. Too. I mean, I, yeah. I, just, I just think they're all over Todd. And I loved him yeah. in 12 Monkeys, but I, I, yeah. I didn't get to enjoy his character in that show as much as I enjoy him here. Um, yeah. You mentioned Terry Metalis, who I've been able to... Um, I've been blessed to communicate with. Yeah. I told him I was talking to you today and he wanted me to say three words to you. I love her. Oh, oh, I love him. So, you know, it's so funny. We are due to have a, like to go out for drinks for like a year now <laughs> because it was one of those things that we saw each other on set. And it's one of those things that, and again, this is what made this particular production special to me is just a connection you find with people like I mean I had to wake up at I wake up at three o'clock in the morning sometimes and like drive to Santa Clarita to get all my stuff done <laughs> and there are very few people I want to spend time with at 4 30 in the morning <laughs> but the makeup trailer you know Terry just he I have to give such props to him and I do all the time. And I, even when I left, I was like, thank you so much. But he so genuinely loves these characters, loves this franchise. Everything he does is what with such care and love that you don't always get that. And I feel so fortunate. I feel so fortunate to be a part of it because from the onset, when I saw that first script, and it said the next generation, I, it gave me chills. <laughs> oh, it gave too. Me chills. Fans too. It so, gave me uh, chills. You've mentioned the words when I left. Um, as a journalist, I've been able to watch the episodes, <laughs> including the one that will have dropped by the time this is seen by the public. Yeah. Can I tell you, when Vatic pulled the trigger on the phaser, I literally screamed, no! Yeah. No! No, and yeah. I know... You had to be coy when you did the interview with um, Greek Girl Authority about, you know, maybe she'll do other things, but hopefully oh, it must have in your heart maybe. to know you were going to be killed. I know. When the, I didn't know. Oh, you I mean, didn't know? I, Not from the beginning. Okay. Didn't tell oh, you. I didn't oh, know. So what was that like? Finding out? Um, well, there's part of you as an actor that's like, they hate me. They don't. There's, there's FOMO. Because you've been on it so long and you want to be to the very end. Right, of course. You want to be you know, there for the last episode. The last episode. Well, and also because, I mean, my my nickname, my nickname amongst, amongst Joe and Jin was 
to Veen MZ. We would get the scripts and we finally get to read them. And I'd be like, I think Ashley and Jack are going to get together. Like I'd have all these theories. Of that, huh? Wow. That's and good. I was, and I was not, you know, and I wasn't in on the thing, but I'm like, it would be logical that this would, like, I'd have all these working theories. And Joe used to call me, he was like, Tavine MZ, like, got the inside of scoop. So when I found out, yeah, I first was like, oh, shit, dude. And then I was like, well, I mean, it hurts because you want to be there to the end. It, you also are like, oh, fuck, did they kill me off because I'm not doing a good job? Like, I mean, you're like, you know, there was that one day that I was having trouble with my lines because I'd been up so early. Oh, and it, like, you know, no. and, and here's the thing. It's none of that. Right. It's none of that. It is, they had to, like, in looking at it and then stepping back from it, you know, and just looking at how you're crafting a story. And Deborah was the one who actually gave me the news. Um and she had left up, it was so funny because she led up to it, you know, very, you know, I love what you're doing, which is why I was gutted when, and I was like, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Um, but, you know, because it was all this thing. And, but I was also just like, wait a minute, especially as I've been watching it, because I didn't know how they were building it. And unlike, you know, a red shirt for that moment, as much as I hate it, because I love this character and I've grown to love her even more is you need it has to be, it has to be one of us. It, it has to be, it has to be me, Jenner. It has to be me, Jenner, Joseph. It's got to be one of us. And, and at the same time, it's also a dramatic turn that it looks like, oh, it's going to be terrible. And then what over here, distraction, you know? Yeah, it, exactly. It's the plot, but right? It, it yeah, the it has to be something. It's good storytelling. Oh, it's great directing you, too. Yeah, you, you have to, depth. you have to give, you know, you have to, as a, you know, as a, and, you know, as a writer, I was like, you know, you're upset and you're depressed because again, if there's a spinoff or something, you want to be part of it. And from the onset, I was like, how are we not going to just like spin this off? Well, and then you're like, and I'm dead. Well, but, Tavine you know, has a twin back on Vulcan or Delta. You never know. So. You never know right? <laughs> but again, I'm like, Tavine threw her Katra in uh, Asmar before she That's left. You know? The Katra, I didn't even think about the Katra. You know, That's... there's there's so many interesting things that could happen, but I'm also just like, you need that moment. Yeah. That moment has to happen. And it's it's kind of Game of Thronesy, man. No one is safe. Like you, you, you put, you, and it gives validity to, you know, that it gives, I mean, if you're going to be killed, be killed by a man plumber. But oh, you know, it's true, <laughs> right? Um, but it just, as much as I was like, uh, it, it's so good for the overall arc of the story that I can't be upset about it. I can be sad because, yeah. of course, I want to, you know, explore. I want to write the like, you know, fan whatever fiction to Veen memoirs or some shit like that. But you have to, if you are in this business, it is my belief that strong narrative, strong story is the thing that keeps us going. And I also, you know, and I also kind of think that this has so been about family and losing someone who you care about, but don't want is what happens in life. Right. You know, it's what, you know, I, I lost my dad really suddenly. It's, We've been so good this season, and Terry has been so good at really making these characters who usually had no con not a whole lot of conflict, give them some conflict and make them even more human than we've seen them before. And Terry has been given a lot of credit, um, a whole crew. Yeah. I'm not going to criticize another show, but some shows don't feature the supporting cast. Oh, yeah. As Picard has. I really yeah. thought we got to meet each of these characters in our own way. You got to say fascinating at one point. Which I was, know, right? You know, I mean, that's like the king of all lines. And, yeah. and, and more than anything, I think that the um, fans, when they find out, they're going to be sad. They really are. You have made an impact on people. I know. Like, as I was going, I was like, I didn't realize people would love me, like love to be in this much. And it's been such an, it's been such an honor and such an interesting experience to be in this thing that you know other people have been like oh my god you know 
people are coming out of the woodwork from like 30 years ago and being like, you're on this show, this amazing, congratulations on your success. And it's interesting as an actor, because I'm like, well, I'm a supporting part of this. I'm not doing super heavy lifting, like, but it's so effective as I forget how the edit is and how we all are. You know, I'm watching, you know, Joseph react. I'm like, oh my God, he's so good. And he's not saying anything. You know, how all, how much apart we all were. And as I'm watching the response to Tavine, I'm just, I keep thinking like, oh shit. Like all I've been thinking this week is like, oh shit. Yeah. What's the next like Thursday? What's it going to be like? The next 24 hours are going to be a yeah. real ride. I'll tell you. I, I yeah. have to ask, do you think Tavine could be a queer character? I mean, is it possible that Vulcans are queer too? I mean, you mentioned- I think so. Well, I think, I think because Tavine, you know, we have endowed her with being a quarter Delton, mm -hmm. um, you know, which I absolutely love just as an actor in terms of playing, you know, opposition internally and whatnot is, I think absolutely. I think Tavine, first and foremost, is very logical about what her job is. And a, apart from everything else, I think this job on this ship and these people are the most important thing to her. And then everything falls from, falls away from that. But I think absolutely, I don't think there is, there is a specific, I don't think there's a specific thing that turns to being on. I think, I, I keep joking, I'm like, her pawn for was off the chain, you know, her pawn for was off, <laughs> off the, the chain. chain right? And, I'm, and like, you throw, I'm like, you throw some Delton in there? What is happening? You know, well, that, that came from a conversation with you and Terry, I read about yeah. her evolution from just bald Vulcan, which we saw in Star Trek three, there were bald Vulcans. Yeah. And it was, it was a little comment. It was a conversation about that, but it was, it was something that I had been thinking about. And I was like, look, when we come, when this comes out, people are going to ask questions and is she, you know, there is, it's this such a striking dare I say iconic it's such a striking look yes that is it just I mean is and we looked is there you know has been bold Vulcans and they've been older and I, I'm like but what if what if this thing and he was like oh yeah I can be down with that let's make her a quarter let's make her a grandmother you know Delta in which you had that much input I love yeah. that I mean that the input. amount of input again when you say like other shows don't show off you know, their bridge crew, the amount of, from the onset, because when I got my audition things, it was different name. I don't remember science officer, but it was not decided what species I was. Just I made a choice thing. that yeah. I was, I made a choice that it seemed to me very spocky and mulcany. So I was like, that's what I'm going to do. And the next thing I know, like that is how it, we all were like, yes, but and so but but to be that involved you know in a character that again on other shows with a different showrunner could just be like maybe yeah, yeah whatever yeah, yeah whatever you know is a fully different ex a fully different and fulfilling experience that's wonderful um you mentioned very early that Jin is another LGBT member of the cast um yeah. is it an LGBT friendly seen the whole idea i mean i imagine having spoken to frakes and lavar burton and patrick stewart oh by the way patrick stewart calls me dawn <laughs> dawn he lets me call him pat and he says i shall call you dawn oh god um would you say it's a very lgbt friendly uh, environment the whole star trek experience oh 100 100 percent. i love yeah, that I, yeah there is yeah there's especially you know behind the scene every yeah there is God damn, it's such a, it's such an open and loving, I mean, it's, it's hard work. Don't get me wrong. It's, it is hard work because it's a long place. But you've also come from the theater. So tell me, what was your first theater experience? Because I imagine that's where your first love is on the stage. It is, it is. Although, I mean, you know, there's nothing like having something, you know, encompassed forever, right? Um, for, I mean, first experience is you know community theater what my first professional job my first professional job was actually called it was on the jersey shore and it was a play called grania the irish pirate queen i played 
a historical character named Grace O'Malley, who lived like the same lifespan as Queen Elizabeth I. Um, and actually Elizabeth put her in jail. She was a pirate. She was, she was an Irish chieftain at a time when you were like, no, dude, like that. I mean, she was this really strong woman at a time. And Irish, Irish, Irish people totally know her history. Like when we did this musical at, you know, Summer Stage, it was Shadow on Summer Stage. We were so we added performances because there was a really large Irish contingent. I believe it. I'm Irish American, so I yeah. Can't so it was that. it was about Granuel, and then and then later and then later they actually the guys who did Les Mis did another thing about her called the Pirate Queen, but it didn't go as well. That's awesome. And that I was, was gonna forget about it because of Jersey Shore, but maybe I should have said, "Oh, that's so lovely, dear." Oh, exactly how right. How wonderful you did that now. Oh, um, wonderful, yeah. And and what are you working on anything else right now? Is there something else we'll see you in? Because I was told at the Glad Awards by a very snotty actress, never ask an actor what they're supposed to be doing next because it's really rude. I'm like, okay, bitch. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am the. I am finishing. I am in the second part of Doom Patrol. Oh, I'll try Doom Patrol. Yeah, awesome. which will come out. I think we our our last six episodes come out in maybe. I don't know. I haven't been given a date, but I'm in the second half of that. Um, and I I feel like you know I'm like no spoilers, but I feel like they do a very. I'm I, I'm really honored to be a part of how all of that result how 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 the whole thing wraps it up. I think it's it's going to be. I think it does the fans well. It does the fans well. So, despite the fact that you um, left the set, is there anything you can tell us about what's com coming in the next two episodes? We have two more episodes left in Picard. No spoilers, but can you give us a hint? Um, <laughs> I'm like I don't fully know actually because I mean, okay. what, yeah. but what I can what I can say is, I feel like especially as we sh shifted into seven and eight. That anyone who thinks they know what's going to happen is just, you know, you got to avoid spoilers and just get ready for the ride. Wow. Just get ready for the ride. Cause it's, there are things that I, you know, found out about that I was like, what? You know, I mean, yeah. I saved the best for last. You got to give me what it's like working with legends like Patrick Stewart and Amanda Plummer. I mean, all the actors, LeVar Burton, Brent Spiner, they're yeah. all incredible actors. But these are legends. Yeah. Like Patrick Stewart is an is such a good storyteller. You know, even in, in even in um holding, there is nothing like just keeping your mouth shut and just like listening to his gorgeous voice. Yes. And then just tell stories about, you know, Mick Jagger and just just his <laughs> life. He was he was in the process of writing his memoir and he is, he is such a statesman and he is such, I mean, he's had such a full, full life. And when he's talking about it, you're just riveted. Like you're just- I can listen to him read the phone book. I, I Yeah, I exactly. I mean, voice. it's, you know, I, I saw him in the Tempest in the Park and I was like, um, cause his voice, you know, uh. and Amanda Plummer, my God, what, an, when I, when I watched her, what an artist. Yeah. Because I've never seen, I don't think I've ever experienced someone who was so uninhibited about really exploring in the moment what your character, like, and it translates so well, is just keeping, as opposed to having the, all right, this is what I do, just consistently just playing with it. And just, there was such, it was so inspiring as an artist to be like, oh, that's right. You can keep playing with it because they'll catch it if they want to. If you want to go back, you can, but her energy is just so, you feel like it's, they're different energies, but they're legends for a reason. Like with her, you're just like, I want to explore the negative space of a pinky and like find out what that means. Like there's such a level of artistry that, trans that that as even as small as she is that just this energy just envelops you just wow. envelops you my daughter is uh 16 uh mm -hmm. has acted a few times in high school productions attended a, a a dramatic school for arts and acting and wants to be an actor and i also told her don't forget to learn how to wait tables but 
Yeah, of course. Good. As a former child actor myself, uh, uh-huh. I did commercials and stuff for about 12 years, I have been trying to give her advice, but rather mm-hmm. than me give her advice because she won't listen to me, I'm her parent. I would love it if you had advice for someone who's a teenager looking to break into acting or pursue the dramatic arts, the theater. What, the would, theater? You, what would you say? If there's something, the one thing I wished that my parents would do um, is I knew early on that that's what I wanted to do. And I didn't, I was not in a position, nor did my parents know how to get me involved in it. They just didn't know. And part of me is like, if you're 16, and you want to do it, try it. Like you're at a place like in the summer, get an agent, go let, you, you're at a, you're at an age where they're a lot more forgiving because you're green. Yeah. Um, and also you get a, you get a chance to figure out if you really want to do it. Cause a lot of people think they want to do it until they have to do it. And part of me is like, there's nothing stopping you, especially at this age from giving it a whirl. I would go give it a whirl. I'd get, get in an acting class and give it a whirl, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. Provided that you as her mother will, you know, allow it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, she calls me her dad. Um, my kids call me dad, but at okay. the same time, I do the job of mom, I'll tell you. Yeah. Um, the thing I will tell you that as also someone who lost their parents, who my parents didn't get to see me be who I am. Uh, yeah. I want you to know that somewhere in the universe, they must be extremely proud of you. And I'm so grateful that you took the time today to give oh. us a peek into your life Oh, God, um, thank you. I'm just, I'm just sorry we won't see you in this character. So let's hope that maybe Terry or Michelle Paradise or some, Akiva or somebody from Star Trek says, you know, she was good in that Picard thing. We ought to yeah. put another character like we did with Todd Stashwick. Give her another oh. shot. Yeah, you know. If not, I'm gonna ride. I'm gonna ride this. I'm gonna ride to Veen to as many confer- uh, conventions as I can. Conventions, that's right. We'll see you there. Right. Live long and prosper. Thank you so much oh, for taking the time. So Happy much. Contact Day. First Contact Day. Uh, Happy First Contact Day to you too.